behalf of the church here, I give you all a, a very warm welcome, especially if you're visiting amongst us this morning. It's good to see you all. Um, I'm just a visitor myself, although sort of kind of a visitor. <laughs> and uh, so most of you know me, Colin Grimwood from Grunsborough, just down the road. And uh, so it's a privilege to be uh, this morning. Just a few notices just to, to bring to your attention. Um, first of all, um, after the service, the teas and coffees will be served in the hall just at the back, so at this door and just down the corridor. And please do stay if you are able to do that. Uh, it would be great just to spend a bit more time together. This evening we shall be doing some discussion that will be sort of moving on from what we'll be preaching this morning. And so there are some little sheets of paper. Um, if you haven't got one and you'd like to, to, to have one, then I'm sure Martin can, can help you out with that. Just with a few questions on, so you can be thinking about it a little bit before uh, tonight. And it might just help you with that discussion this evening. And I'll be at six o'clock. Uh, the new prayer diary for September is also out, so please do take one of those away with you as well. Um, and also, just a, an advance notice on 10th of September, there's a breakfast bat and coffee uh, morning for Caring for Life at Shepherd Drive Baptist Church in Ipswich. And so everybody's welcome to go along to that as well. Uh, so that's the, the notices. I shall mention a few other things for prayer as we... A little, little later on, um, would you remember Tom, the pastor here, and Ellie and his and their family on holiday uh, this week? So pray they will have a restful time. Well, let's uh, just read a few verses uh, from the Psalms as so we become to to worship now, uh, from Psalm 148. Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord from the heavens! Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you stars. Praise him, you heavens of heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven, and he has exalted the horn of the strength of his people, the praise of all his saints, the children of Israel, a people near to him. Praise the Lord. We're going to join in the praises of our God in our first song this morning, All Creatures of Our God and King. It's uh, there's an updated version of the old hymn. The, the tune is the same, um, but uh, you'll notice one or two new verses in there and uh, that uh, bring it up to, uh, to, to date with uh, rejoicing in God as our Saviour. All creatures of our God and King.
come to the Lord now in prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we bow in your holy presence this morning and come to praise and worship your great and glorious name. For you are the God who has made all things. You are the God who created the heavens and the earth. You made the sky, the stars, the sun, the moon, the vastness of this great universe. You made the animals and the flowers. You've made us. And all that we have, Lord, you provide for us. We thank you, Lord, for your wonderful wisdom, skill, and power that we see in the creation around us, in all its beauty, in all its complexity, in all its wonder. Lord, we thank you for these things. We worship you. Lord, we come to as your people, a people created by you to bring praise to you, a people who have experienced a new birth. We are new creations in the Lord Jesus Christ, delivered from sin and brought into a newness of life. And Lord, we thank you that you have made us into your people. We thank you that you're still calling in a people into your kingdom to become part of that great number which no one can count. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us by your Spirit doing praises to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God, most glorious. Amen. Well, I'd love to see some younger ones here this morning, and uh, perhaps I, mean, I know one or two names, but there's a lot of names I don't know. So if you want to tell me your name, you put your hand up, and you can tell me your name. Yes, Al Yana, that's right, yes. Who else wants to tell me their name? Put your hand up if you can tell me your name. Yep. Artorias. Yep. And anybody else wants to tell me their name? All right. Well, if you didn't get it before, I'm Colin, okay? So we've got my, got my name anyway. But to one day, there was a, a young girl went to a church in London. And something was said that made her really excited. And she said to the pastor at the end of the service, Pastor, I've just discovered my name is in the Bible. And the pastor said, now tell me what your name is. And she said, Edith. And he said, I'm sorry, but I don't think the name Edith appears in the Bible. And she said, it does. I heard you say it when you read the Bible this morning. You read, Jesus received sinners and Edith with them. Now, for those who are over 40, you'll probably get it. But those who are under 40, you might not. Because, um, because we wouldn't normally say what was read there. It was old language. The Bible was the old language. And it would, we would say today, Jesus receives sinners and eats with them. But in old language, it would have been Jesus receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And she thought eateth was Edith. So she had made a mistake. So Jesus receives sinners and eateth or eats with them, but she thought it was Edith with them. But there's a wonderful truth even in that mistake, isn't there? She, she, she misheard what was said but Jesus does receive sinners, and that included her. Edith was included. Yes, he receives sinners, he receives all kinds of people, and he receives Edith too. I wonder whether that made her realize that Jesus would receive her and forgive her and make her his friend. In a sense, Everyone's name is in the Bible. Whatever your name might be, it's there in the Bible in one sense, isn't it? Because there's a verse in the Bible that says that God so loved the world that whoever believed that he that God sorry, God so loved the world, he gave us his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And whoever includes anyone, isn't it? So you could put yourself in there, couldn't you? Whoever includes you and me, if we believe in the Lord Jesus, we have everlasting life. 
So in some ways, you could put your name where Edith thought her name was. Jesus receives sinners and Eliana with them. Jesus receives sinners and Artorias with them. Jesus receives sinners and Colin with them. And whatever your name is, you could put your name in there that Jesus will receive you when you come to him knowing that you have sinned against the Lord, knowing that you want Jesus to be your Savior, to be your Lord, to, be, to, to lead your life, he will receive you in his love. No matter how bad a sinner we may have been, no matter what we may be, Jesus receives us. We may, not, we may feel we're not very important in life. But Jesus receives us. And he said that whoever comes to me Whoever comes to me, I'll by no means cast out. And he'll never say, I don't, I've got time for you. He'll receive you when you come to him. Well, what a wonderful thing that is, isn't it? Jesus receives sinners and you with them. Okay, well, shall we sing again now? And it's a, it's a hymn, And Can It Be? And it reminds us, of, uh, for those of us who are trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, of how he has received us, what he has done for us by his sacrifice on the cross. <laughs>
We're going to come to time of prayer and intercession just in a moment, but just to share a few matters to bring to the Lord in prayer. Um, that um, uh, Janet was here, but uh, she's had to take John into accident and, and emergency this morning because he's had a fall. So we pray, pray for John that uh, the damage should be minimal. The Lord will be with him just at this time. We think of Derek Hillman still in hospital and feeling a bit down, got COVID on the ward, so people can't visit him just at the moment. Um, I remember Tom and Ellie on holiday, and then there are those struggling with health on a longer term basis. Um, David and Janet Strange, Derek Moss, John Brown, Bob Wilding, Ed and Hannah Merchant, Dorian Catling, Joyce Mays, and John and Dorian Leader. But it's good to see them with us this morning. But uh, out this morning, that's really good and encouraging. Let's remember youth clubs and toddlers group that starts um, week beginning for month, tomorrow week. And so pray for, for that. But uh, many youngsters will, will want, want to come uh, to those groups and that will be a good opportunity to teach them of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's, uh, let's come before the Lord now in prayer. Let's pray. Our most gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words of that hymn that we have been singing. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? We thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins. We thank you that he bore uh, the, 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 the judgment that we deserve. We thank you, dear Lord, that he paid the utmost sacrifice. And Lord, we recognize that we do not deserve it. We are so undeserving. And Lord, we recognize too that even since coming to know you, we still let you down so much. Since repenting of our sins, yet Lord, we still stumble and fall. And Lord, we confess our sins again before you this morning. Sins of thought and word and deed. Things, O oh Lord, we have said we should not have said. Things perhaps that we have pondered upon, we should not have pondered upon. Or where we have put idols in our lives and worship them rather than you. Lord, we pray, forgive us. We pray, turn us from all those things that are displeasing in your sight. And help us, O oh Lord, by your spirit to walk in the paths of righteousness. To walk in paths of love and peace. To live according to your will. To be holy as you are holy. Our gracious God, we pray today for the work of the gospel in this place. Lord, we pray, especially for the work amongst the young. We pray for the children and young people here this morning, that you would bless them. We pray, dear Lord, for uh, the, uh, the uh, um, work uh, that will be taking place in the, in the youth groups uh, uh, next week onwards. And Lord, we pray that you would speak to many youngsters there and their families also. Oh, my gracious God, we pray uh, that you would bless them while they are young and deliver them, we pray, from the evils of the, of the world and draw them to Christ and may give their hearts to him while they are still young. Our loving God, we pray for Tom and Ellie and their family and ask that you'll be with them and bless them on their time of holiday. May they be, be refreshed and revitalized and, and return back uh, with their energy. Lord, bless Tom's ministry here, we do pray, and use him, give him all wisdom. And we pray for those who are in poor health at this time. We do pray for John uh, there in the accident and emergency, and pray, Lord, for your help for him, your peace in his heart. We pray for Derek, Lord, encourage him and strengthen him there in hospital. We do pray for David and Janet, for Derek Moss, and for John Brown, for Bob, Ed and Hannah, for Doreen and for Joyce and for John and Doreen. Lord, we commend them each to you. Lord, give them patience in their weakness. May they lean upon you. May they find in you their strength. We pray, Lord, that even through the frailty of the body, may only help them to see the greater glories of those things that are eternal. Lord, give us a heart of desire for those things, we pray. And our loving Father, we pray to, that you would have mercy too upon the country of Ukraine and we pray dear Lord for peace in Ukraine. 
Lord God, we ask for an end uh, to the warfare. We pray, Lord, for your help for all who are suffering, for all who are, are, are bereaved, for those who have had to leave their homes. Lord, we commend them into your gracious hand. We do pray for Ira and Tim and Sophia here this morning and for many others, O oh Lord, in a similar position. So, Lord, we pray that you bless your word to us as we look into that in a few moments, we pray. For we come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I think I've forgotten something. Is the children great at the stage or, or before this stage? Is that right? Not today, not today. All right, okay. So things have, things have changed. Yep. Okay. Well, uh, Elder is now going to bring to us the reading from God's word uh, from Mark chapter 15. Verses 21 to 41. Thank you, <clears throat> Mark chapter 15, verse 21 to 41. In the Church Bibles, it's um, page 852. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, <clears throat> the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place and they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each would take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priest <clears throat> with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He save others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani? which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry, and breathe his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who, <clears throat> who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Thank you, Elva. It's always moving, isn't it, to read? the account of the crucifixion. And we're going to sing now uh, concerning the love of the Father that he should give his son for us and just reminding ourselves again of the 
of what it meant uh, for God to provide salvation for us sinners. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure. seven sayings that Jesus spoke when he was on the cross. There's only one that's recorded in Matthew and Mark. They don't record any of the other sayings that Jesus said. Um, they just record the one. And it's in those plaintive words in verse 34 of Mark 15. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I was beginning to get a little bit troubled. Last Sunday I was here in the congregation and uh, Tom was talking about some preaching on recently. And one of those was Psalm 22, which has this, which is what Jesus was quoting here. So I thought, oh, perhaps you've covered this already. I'd already planned uh, for, for this morning. And, uh, but uh, he, Tom assured me that he didn't uh, go into to too much detail uh, uh, concerning uh, this uh, statement on the cross on that occasion. But I think it fits in with, with what he would have spoken about, with, the, with, with what, how David felt. And also from Psalm 42 last week. Uh, where the psalmist was uh, crying out for God, thirsting for God, because he felt, in a sense, cut off. And so we have that here this morning. Let's just remind ourselves of the, of the scene, that he was Jesus. He was beaten and battered, crowned with thorns. 
to carry his cross through the streets of Jerusalem with the crowds watching and maybe jeering as he went along the way, soldiers pushing, urging him on until he presumably stumbles and can carry his cross no longer and Simon has to help him. When they arrive, reach the place Golgotha, there they offer him wine mingled with myrrh to dull the pain to some extent, but he refuses anything that will take away the pain. There he is crucified at the junction of a busy street where people will be continually passing by. The Romans would, would crucify people in very public places as a, as a warning to anybody who might be tempted to break the law. And there, as the people gather around, many people would have been gathered around, especially with such a high-profile person. Jesus hears them mocking him, reviling him. Even the chief priests, the religious leaders, chime in mercilessly with their cutting words. The soldiers don't care. All they're worried about is getting a perk. They would get his clothes, and so they, they, they cast lots and share out his clothes at the foot of the cross. The agonizing screams of the other prisoners would have pierced the air as well. Or maybe their deep groans uh, would have uh, echoed through uh, that place. Three long, painful, agonizing hours passed. And at midday, there was darkness. The sun, in some way or other, is blotted out. The whole land is, 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 uh, becomes filled with darkness. It wasn't a, a, an eclipse of the sun. It was full moon. You can't have an eclipse in full moon. And an eclipse doesn't last for three hours either. It was something miraculous. Something that, we're, that God had brought into play. Perhaps this eerie darkness silences the cries. For three hours, Jesus suffers there in that silence. But finally, the silence is broken with this cry My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? It's a cry of distress, as profound as it is disturbing. It's the most moving, heart-wrenching words we could hear. What's going on here? What does it mean? What is Jesus saying? Why does he say it? We certainly have an insight into the agony of Jesus' soul a window into what was going on within him. What a, a terrible ordeal he was going through internally. He was the Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, so close to the Father. Never had there been one moment of tension between Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He walked perfectly in his ways. He pleased him in every way. He was the Father who loved him so, so much with an infinite love. The Son who pleased him so perfectly. The one who had rejoiced in his smile. The one who had ever leaned on his bosom. Now he's abandoned him. I remember hearing a man who said that he was he was born in Colombia. At the age of four, his mother took him out into the, into the street and left him and walked off. Just imagine what it must have felt like to a four-year-old child. Your mum walking off, leaving you there. Imagine the distress. Why? Why have you left me? Come back! And it just gives us perhaps just a fractional insight into what was going on in Jesus as he in his perplexity of mind as he cries out, Why? Why? Why have you forsaken me? I have been so righteous, so faithful. Surely God 
the God, the covenant, keeping the promise, keeping God would be with me to help me, to be there at all times, to support me against my enemies. This is the God he had trusted in right from birth, right from his mother's womb. And we may remind ourselves of Psalm 22 there. All those who see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust when I was on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth, from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. There was none to help. While they were crying out, look, God has left him. Now Jesus says, Lord, why have you forsaken me? I've leaned upon you all my life. Now you've abandoned me. Notice that he doesn't cry out, my father. So often he would refer to God as his father, wouldn't he? But here it is not my father, why have you forsaken me? But my God. There's no longer that sense of his fatherly love and affection surrounding him. No longer that closeness, that intimacy he had. He cannot appeal to him as his father, but as his God, because he seems so much more distant. It isn't mere suffering that he's going through. It's the absence of God that pierced him so much. This is the only time we read of him crying out in any kind of agony. It wasn't when they nailed him to the cross. It wasn't when they hung him up there. It wasn't when the people mocked him. It was not those things that hurt so much. It was the fact that he was now abandoned. We mustn't think that it was God the Father abandoning God the Son, as though God can somehow be divided. I think we must understand this as God the Father abandoning the Lord Jesus Christ, as, our, as the, 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 the man, in a sense, the mediator. Jesus as, uh, as our mediator standing in our place. But still, it was very distressing. Very, very painful. But was it just Jesus feeling distressed because of his great suffering? Was it because he just longed to be delivered and, and he expected God to be there just to help him in his time of need? Was he just looking for some sign of God's help just then? Was it that because his sufferings are so great, he just there and he felt abandoned? I think there's more to it than that. And I think the fact that Matthew and Mark record only this one utterance of Jesus gives it some prominence here. The crying this out. It comes out of a sense of him being bearing the judgment for our sin. It wasn't just he felt that God wasn't there. It was that God truly had turned his back on him. And God, is, for a moment, had rejected him in a sense. And that points to judgment. Just think of a number of things that all point in that same direction. And think of first of all of the cup that uh, we, we we read in in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, that night before when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying earnestly to his father then and he's calling him father then isn't he in chapter fourteen and verse thirty six of Mark says Abba Father all things are possible for you take this cup away from me nevertheless not what I will but what you will this cup this cup, he calls his sufferings a cup. In, in John 18, when uh, uh, the, uh, uh, he's arrested in, in, the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, and uh, Peter tries to come in, in his defense with his, with his sword, doesn't he? And, and Jesus says, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my Father has given me? 
was a cup speak of? He sees his sufferings of drinking from that cup. What does that cup speak of? It speaks of a cup of wrath. That's what it so often refers to in the Bible. Just to take one or two examples. In Isaiah 51 and verse 17. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem. You who have drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. You have drunk the, you have drunk the dregs of the cup of trembling and drained it out. The cup of his fury. This is what is, we're talking about here. The cup of God's judgment, of his anger with sin. We read of that a number of other times in the Bible, drinking the cup of the wrath of God. Then there is the darkness. It points in the same direction, doesn't it? There's three hours of darkness in the middle of the day. And, uh, for instance, again, it speaks of judgment. In Joel chapter 2 and verse 31, I'll read verse 30 as well. I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood for the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Darkness speaks of judgment. We read of the, like the, the lazy servant who um, hid his talent in the ground and he was committed to outer darkness where there was wailing and gnashing of teeth darkness is a place of judgment it is the absence of light of comfort of hope it is the removal of god who is light and again the timing of his cry is as we said not when he was nailed to the cross or when the crowd mocked him but at the end of those three hours of intense darkness but it's connected with this darkness, isn't it? It's connected with this sense of, of, the, of God's wrath and judgment. And the very fact of the cup and the darkness and the timing and the abandonment. Because to be abandoned by God is a judgment, isn't it? You see it a little bit in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve are kicked out of the Garden of Eden. No longer do they enjoy that same fellowship with God that they had before. We see it in Ezekiel when, when God is, removes himself from the temple in Jerusalem. The people of Jerusalem are about to face the Babylonian, final Babylonians sort of take over and they're going to be taken off into exile and, and God removes himself from the temple. And gradually he comes away to the threshold of the temple and then to the hillside and then he, he leaves them leaves them to their doom. Abandonment is God leaving people to their doom. What Jesus is going through here is a judgment. This is not something that was afflict, inflicted by men, but by God himself. Men had done their worst. Men had mocked him, they'd knelt at the cross, they tried to, they tried to get rid of him, they did their worst, but nothing that they did could come near what God did to his son. As Isaiah reminds us, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. Although the NIV puts it, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. It was God who did it. It wasn't man inflicting the suffering. It was God inflicting the suffering on the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul Wells, in the book The Forgotten Christ, says this, the abandonment of Christ corresponds to a descent into hell. Full well that the Father rejects only the wicked. We have to understand this abandonment, not just as some kind of cry of agony, of suffering, that uh, it all seems so bad, but a cry because he was under the judgment of God. Because he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He became sin. He, God, looked upon him and saw our sin and poured upon him 
our judgment. He bore a curse for sinners. And Peter says in 1 Peter 2 that he himself bore our sins, his own body on the tree. Jesus was standing in the place of sinners. Jesus was bearing our judgment, our burden, our curse. He bore the curse for us. The people around him were totally blind, weren't they? Some of those, as verse 35 says, some of those who stood by when they heard it said, Look, he's calling for Elijah. They made light of it, they had no idea what it was all about. What about you this morning? What about you? What does the cross mean to you? When you read these things, what does it mean to you? Do you see what Christ is suffering? And do you see why he is suffering it? Do you see the wonder of his sacrifice? Do you see Jesus crying the sin of sinners? Do you see him bearing your sin? Does it move your soul? Or do you see nothing more than Jesus just suffering a terrible ordeal? What does it mean to you? To them, the crowds around, they couldn't understand it. They didn't know what was going on. They just saw the outlet. Is that all you see? Or do you see Jesus dying on the cross for sinners? you. Let me just draw three applications as uh, we just draw, draw this to, to, to apply it to our lives. The first thing is, we see this terrible thing, this thing that we can really barely grasp, can we, with, with, our, with, our, with the best of our intentions, and you know, we can only skim the surface of what Jesus was going through here. It tells us, first of all, how terrible it is to face the judgment of God. How terrible it is to face the judgment of God. Here is a glimpse into hell. As Jesus is first suffering physically, he suffers on the cross. He's suffering mentally. He is suffering spiritually. To. What makes it so, so much worse is that abandoned by God. What is it to be abandoned by God? We take God's blessings for granted. We live in a world full of his blessings. He causes the sun to shine. He causes the rain to fall. He provides for us. He, he gives us love and friendship and family and all these kind of wonderful things. We have so many blessings day by day. But then in hell, total darkness, forsaken by God, abandoned forever. None of those blessings. None of those blessings come to us whatsoever. That's a horrific prospect, isn't it? Horrific prospect. No comforts. No light. No relief. Total, utter abandonment. They say that the worst experience of life No hope. And how awful it is. In the Second World War, the great battleship, the German battleship, the Bismarck, was sunk by the Allies. And as it was sunk, hundreds of troops, the sailors, uh, were, were, were dived into the sea and they started heading towards some of the British ships. And uh, some of them were being rescued. And the news came that there was a German U boat on the way. And so the British ships were told to leave everybody and go. And just imagine if you were swimming and you just got almost to that, to that British ship 
and you sort turn around and full, go full steam away from you and leave you in the middle of the sea without hope. No one's going to rescue you. That's what hell is. No hope. This is the plight of all who die in their sins. Who die without Christ. What awful words Jesus uses in the parable of the sheep and the goats uh, when, um, uh, the, when he turns to the, the goats and says to them, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. My plea for you this morning is that don't let this be your fate. Don't let this be your fate. There are some who make a laugh of hell. They say, all my friends will be there. But hell is no laughing matter. Some never think of it. But they're closing their eyes to reality. If you haven't already, you need to seek the Lord's mercy. You need to come to Christ. And we know that he does receive sinners. And he'll receive you with them. You need to turn your eyes to the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to come to him. A repentant sinner. And say, Lord, will you have me back? Lord, have mercy upon me. I know that I deserve hell. Have mercy upon me. Make me your own. Christ endure hell. That you might not have to go through that. That you might be saved from that. The second thing is Christ was forsaken. We may never be. It tells us of the, how terrible it is to face the judgment of God. But it also tells us that Christ was forsaken, that we may never be forsaken. We'll come back to this a little bit more this evening. Uh, but um, it is in Christ we find real comfort and hope. It is Christ as the one we can trust in as our rock, because it is through his death for us. Yes, bearing that judgment, bearing that abandonment, it is through his death that we are reconciled to God, we are brought to peace with God. He has dealt with the sin that separated us from God and brought us into God's judgment that we might know peace with God. And we remember that Jesus did not die abandoned. He died committing his spirit into the, into the hand of his Father. His experience of judgment here preceded his victory. He dealt with it. He, he drank that cup, that cursed cup, to the very dregs. He drank all of that judgment. So we not drink any of it that we might be at peace with God, our sins forgiven, that we might have not the cup of cursing, but the cup of blessing. In my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. And if that is so, we're trusting in Christ. We know that no longer does God hold our sins against us. Christ has done that, he's borne that. God has received us for his sake. He has forgiven us for his sake. He has had mercy on us for his sake. And he will never turn away from us. He will never turn against us. He has embraced us in his son once and for all and forever. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Never will he condemn us for our sin. What a contrast with Jesus' experience, isn't it? God is always. However much we may suffer in this world, whatever we may go through in this world, God will not abandon us because he's received us in Christ. He abandoned Christ to pay for our sins. He will never abandon us. What an assurance that is. We'll never have to cry out as Jesus did. Not in a real sense. I fear that sometimes. We'll come back to that tonight. But uh, we'll never to know what it is to be abandoned by God. 
Remember how terrible the judgment of God is. Remember that Jesus was abandoned that we may never be. But finally, don't take forgiveness for granted. How do we look at our sin? Do we take sin too lightly? Friend, look at what it cost him. Look at the cross. See the darkness. Feel the gloom. Hear that cry piercing through the eerie silence. Jesus crushed for you. Jesus bearing the curse, forsaken, that you might be blessed. Don't forget what it cost him. And so therefore don't take sin lightly. Don't take salvation lightly. We can become blase about it a bit, can't we? We get so used to it. We've been a Christian for many years and we just almost take it for granted sometimes. And sometimes we take sin lightly. We think, well, it doesn't matter if I indulge in a little gossip or watch something that's not very that's inappropriate. Or I don't control my tongue. Oh, it's just how I am. Just how you know. We know we're all sinners. We know it doesn't really matter. God will forgive me. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all sin. We need to remember the blood. Of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. How can I sin against you, Lord? How can I grieve your heart that was broken for me upon the cross? Let's learn to hate the sin that cost him so dear. Let's learn to seek to be as holy by his grace and strength as we can be. Let us love him who so loved us that he's prepared to give through all of that. May this will pass to him more and more deeply. This is the Jesus who has saved us. This is the Jesus we serve. This is the Jesus we should now love and want to please and not want to grieve. Oh, our sins, they look horrible in the light of the cross, don't they? We're going to sing in a moment. Let me just read some of the verses of that hymn. Who can think without admiring? Who can hear and nothing feel? See the Lord of life expiring, yet retain a heart of steel. Angels here may gaze and wonder what the God of love could mean when he tore that heart asunder, never once defiled by sin. We just spend a moment in reflection and prayer and silence of prayer. Oh Lord, we pray, open our eyes to see the wonder of the cross, to see the cost of our salvation, to see what it meant for you, the Holy One, to bear away our sin, to see the love of Christ so clearly drawn there. Lord, if any have not yet come to see that, if any yet have not come to you, Lord Jesus, we pray you'll draw their hearts. And Lord, we pray that they may seek your salvation, that they may be spared from that judgment that you went through. And Lord, for those of us who have come to know you, Lord, may we love you more and more. Amen. Should we sing the hymn but on the wings of faith uprising Jesus crucified I see while his love my soul surprising cries 
I suffered all for thee. <laughs> you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>